when we thought of a series that would address the question, where do we go from here? Lenise Pinkard came to our minds and hearts as someone that we wanted to, selfishly, we wanted to listen to at this time. And we knew that we wouldn't be alone um, in, in that feeling of, of curiosity of, about what you're thinking and feeling right now, Lenise, and, and what lessons um, you're picking out of this unusual and, and challenging time. I want to actually copy a couple of links into the chat right now for those of you who might not be as familiar with Lenise's work and her thought as I am. I'm going to put two uh, links in there of articles that um, were no less than life changing for me when I read them. Um, the first one. I read before I knew Lenise personally, and the second one I read afterwards. Um, and I just highly recommend them. Um, the one uh, in Takoon Magazine, Revolutionary Suicide, I want folks to know, um, was one of just a small handful of readings that we selected at East Point and in our work with a, a network of other organizations. As, as core reading for a, a really beautiful project that we're working on called the Yet to Be Named Network at this point. We still don't know if or when it will have a name. Um, but this is a network of direct action teams positioned at the intersection of climate justice and racial justice. And when we decided to launch this thing, Revolutionary Suicide, this article by Lenise provided us with this, this incredible glue um, for those of us who feel called to do work at this intersection of racial healing and climate justice. And in it, Lenise displays this incredible um, way of looking at the work of, of, of justice, of building justice from a very integral sort of perspective that, that includes the personal the interpersonal, the social, and the systemic. And it's just written with passion and grace. And I, I expect that we'll see and hear the same from Lenise right now as she addresses us. So please do look at those to learn more about Lenise and her work and how she views things. And welcome so, so warmly, uh, Lenise, to this space. And thanks again to everybody uh, for being here to to listen along. Thank you so much. It's a great blessing and privilege and honor to be here with all of you. Um, so many of you I know and some I don't know, but thank you East Point, Chris and Astrid and East Point for having me. We're going to explore something tonight that I'm calling wake work. <clears throat> My first job when I was 12 was singing at the what we called wakes. In the evening after homework and dinner were done, it was really my mother's part-time job. She played the piano and organ for families who needed music for the service but didn't have a musician. If I got my homework done and finished my dinner, more often than not, several times a week, my mother would invite me to assist her. Even as a little girl, I was a gifted singer. I knew lots of church songs, gospel songs, and spirituals by heart. And besides, I was a little church lady in training. And instinctively, I knew who and how to be. How to be genuinely kind, put people at ease, and reassure them. I loved this work because through the lattice, work from the room in the back of the funeral chapel at Wade Funeral Home, I could see and hear and feel the mourning and even the joy and feel how we were all connected to each other. I felt like we knew the range and depth of feelings in ourselves and in each other, the vulnerability, fear, love, rage, compassion, courage, despair, and hope in ourselves, in each other, and in the world. 
People were in touch with their most authentic feelings and able to voice them when they spoke and to tap into soul and spirit when we were silent together. We, found, we, we had formed and become a mystical circle and healing had begun in us. Often the family and friends of the deceased would hold hands in silence, clasping while the preacher prayed, O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Then each in turn would speak, sometimes in defense of the dead or in praise or of their loss. And they listened to each other, putting judgment aside. And then I would sing, precious Lord, Take my hand, lead, lead me on, and let me stand. And others would spontaneously join in or shout out in praise or grief or weep or we would sing spontaneously what wanted to be sung. And people would go freely back and forth between their seats and the coffin to show love and respect and affection and grief for one gone on home. And then maybe some silence or informal meditation, contemplation or testimony or prayer, an invitation of blessings for loved ones that remain, an extra to look deep within and clean around your own heart. And then a reminder that every goodbye ain't gone and we will meet again on the other shore where the wicked will cease from troubling and the weary will be at rest and God will wipe every tear from our eyes and there won't be no more death. All God's children go wear a crown and put on shoes and dance all over God's heaven and everybody say, Amen. And there was always food and drink and sweets. And so it went pretty much just like that, day to day, week to week. And those wakes shaped me and changed me and grew me up. And even as a little girl, made me know and see and feel the connection between love and death. Love? She doesn't know nothing about it made me understand that every person ever born who dares to live, which means who, share, who dares to love, is certain of one thing, she is going to suffer. There is no way to live, to love, and not suffer. And this is true even for God. Even God suffers the suffering of love. We are in the wake of COVID-19, the wait and watch resident time of the quarantine that elicits in us a certain strain of apocalypticism and forces us to reside in the hopelessness of now, to live in a spiritual crawl space. It forces us to admit that we are living in a moment when all of the standards for which especially the Western world for so long and victory absolutely must come back to a deeply imperiled planet. Or I can say it another way, amidst a global pandemic is forcing us to admit that the world for which we have been so carefully prepared is being taken away from us by the grace of God. There is never a time in the future when we will work out our soul salvation. The challenge is in this moment. The time is always now. And so now, 
we must recognize and declare that the upheaval going on all around us at the least affirms that our deadly way of life is collapsing in on itself and has already begun to kill us. But perhaps this is a crisis that is too good to waste. And that possibility, my friends, is why I am calling you to my own version of what Christine Sharp calls wake work. The reason that I call this time that we are in a global wake is because what is behind us is a long, long row of coffins. And we had better turn around and take a long, loving look at the real. Not just the real dead, the real deaths, but the real deathliness of our collective then stories and now stories. When I speak of wake work, I am not talking about the obsessive engagement with and the recounting of everyday forms of atrocity, commonly known as atrocitology. I am not talking merely about necromics or reviewing death tolls and body counts. Although absolutely justified, I want to posit that the scorn that we direct at stupidity and callousness of a president and his administration, some governors and a mayor, the scorn at the statistical innumeracy and historical ignorance of various ideologues and propagandists, and at the indifference of much traditional history to the magnitude of human suffering behind cataclysmic events and happenings is a distraction, even if merited, from the work at hand. We must now see more sharply and feel more deeply and think more painfully and act more outrageously than we have ever done before. Notice a few minutes ago that I said we must take a long look at the real. That is to say that we have an opportunity in this holy time out to get away from the short while of distracting obsessions and diversions in favor of what Thomas Munzer, a 15th century preacher and radical theologian, calls the long, long while. The long while points to a freedom from the constraints of time, from rushing after whatever diverts us at any moment. So occupied with social distancing, so coupled with social distancing, I want to call for spiritual distancing that arises from the distance established from what is regarded as the normal world. Getting back to normal, a world founded on power, greed, and violence. In different situations, spiritual distancing varies between dissent, abstinence, refusal, boycott or strike, reform or counterproposal, dialogue or meditation. Whether we engage withdrawal, renunciation, divergence, dissent, reform, resistance, reforms, there is a leave our homes, but I part of what it means to do wake work, that no one is excluded or eliminated. The work is marked by revolution. A real struggle for most white people. The wake, we have enough reason to cry, even tear gas. We are getting the opportunity.
Pluto to be sharply and feeling deeply in in an unsettling proximity to the past. Our work requires us, as Donna Haraway puts it, to stay with the trouble. To stay with the trouble is to ask, as Christine Sharp asked, how do we encounter a past that is not past? Well, we move a step closer to that by moving into a thick, ongoing present, rife with colonialism, racism, nationalism, and vulture capitalism in all their plundering brutality. In this wake work, if we do not hide, and if we do not lie, we can glimpse this moment of temporal and cultural collision that occurs when the past is bodied forth into our present, into our homes, living rooms, kitchens, and Zoom sessions. Wake work is very hard and often tedious because it is a kind of enfleshed education that demands a certain daring a certain independence of mind and will, we are learning to think. And in order to learn to think, we have to learn to think about everything. There mustn't be something we can't think about. If there is one thing that we cannot think about, very shortly we cannot think about anything at all. Now there is always something in this country, of course, that one cannot think about. Black people, for example. But time will prove the connection between the level of the lives we lead and the extraordinary endeavor to avoid the Blacks. Or I am not talking about crossing the street when you see one, a Black, that is. I am talking about avoiding having to see sharply and feel deeply and think painfully and act outrageously in response to the fact that large and growing agglomerations of black people have become wasted humans. And this status, likely to become durable and permanent, calls for stricter segregationist policies and extraordinary security measures. Less to the health of society, the normal functioning of the social system be endangered. Social distancing is not hardly new. The notorious task of tension management and pattern maintenance that according to Talcott Parsons, each system needs to perform in order to survive presently boil down almost entirely to the tight separation of human waste or more to the point, wasted humans from the rest of society. Its exemption from the legal framework in which the life pursuits of the rest of society are conducted and its neutralization. Human waste, wasted humans, can no longer be removed to distant waste disposal sites and placed firmly out of bounds to normal life. It needs, or they need, to be sealed off in tightly closed containers. The penal system supplies such containers. In a nutshell, prisons, like so many other social institutions, have moved from the task of recycling to that of waste disposal. All waste is potentially poisonous, deadly, or at least being defined as waste, it is deemed to be contaminating and disturbing to the proper order of things. In a nutshell, prisons are used today as quarantine zones in which purportedly dangerous individuals condemned to a life of refuse on a refuse heap are segregated in the name of safety. Wake work to see sharply, to feel deeply, to think painfully, to act outrageously, wake work. Dionne Brand in her book, 
a map to the door of no return, seeks to articulate a method of encountering a past that is not past. Brand says we have to sit with it. Donna Haraway says we have to stay with the trouble until we achieve a thick ongoing present. Wake work is also about keeping track of the evil, that which works against life, that disproportionately and devastatingly affects black peoples any and everywhere black people are. We all know that black lives are still imperiled and devalued by a racial calculus and political arithmetic that were entrenched centuries ago. Wake work is not about looking for political, juridical, or philosophical answers to the problem of blackness. Although in other contexts that might yield good fruit. Wake work, being in the wake is about the soul work, not the analysis and metrics and data of seeing sharply, feeling deeply, thinking painfully about the daily disasters that assault black people now, keeping track of the thick present conditions of spatial, legal, psychic, material, and other dimensions of black non-being. The very real afterlife of slavery. What is that afterlife that Donna Haraway calls the thick ongoing present? Skewed life chances. Limited access to health and education, lack of access to opportunity structures, premature death, incarceration, and impoverishment. A people always imagined as carriers of terror, terror's embodiment and not the primary objects of terror's multiple enactments globally. People for whom incessant danger and disaster attach to all right, always already weaponized black bodies. These are bodies to which anything and everything is and can be done. In the aftermath of the Emanuel AME murders of people who were worshiping while black, Claudia Rankin published a New York Times op-ed piece titled, The Condition of Black Life is One of Mourning. Rankin writes, though the white liberal imagination likes to feel temporarily bad about black suffering, there really is no mode of empathy that can replicate the daily strain of knowing that as a black person, you can be killed for simply being black. No hands in your pockets, no playing music, no sudden movements, no driving your car, no walking at night, no walking in the day, no turning onto this street, no entering this building, no standing your ground, no standing here, no standing there, no talking back, no playing with toy guns, no living while black. Right now, in the state of North Carolina where I live, black people are 22% of the state's population, but make up 39% of the coronavirus cases and 37% of the deaths. Talking about wake work. While I concur with Claudia Rankin that the condition of black life is one of mourning, I want to distinguish what we are calling wake work from the work of mourning. And though wake work is in part at least attentive to mourning, and the morning work takes place at the local, translocal, and global levels, and that morning, an event might be interminable. How does one mourn the interminable event? Just as wake work troubles morning, so too do the wake and the wake work trouble the ways that most museums and memorials take up trauma and memory. How does one memorialize the everyday? This is not about a set of experiences that are to be seen as past. How does one memorialize chattel slavery and its afterlives, which are unfolding still? 
How do we memorialize an event that is still ongoing? How does one in the words so often used by institutions come to terms with, which usually means move past ongoing and daily atrocity? Wake work means we never seek to come to terms with any of the forms of black death. We must pray that we never become psychically, emotionally, spiritually small enough to move past it. You will never be successful at it. Wake work means that we resist conclusion, resist definition, resist final formulation. We must become capable of living with, not merely existing, but living with, bearing the fact that with each passing day, we collectively continue to amass more and more debt, shared but never credited, and never abiding credit. It will never be paid off. We will not be able to actually make the transition that many of us attempt again and again, moving from an unconscious, unconscious unsuspecting, tolerated impotence to a paralysis of analysis that leads to a resignation that screams, there is nothing I or we can do. It is out of our hands. It is only out of our hands if we will not pick it up. And that means making the practical step of confronting a life-threatening power, an irreversible step that you forget or undo only at the price of self betrayal. You will always need to linger, to stay with the pain and continue to reckon with stuff that will touch the most vulnerable points of our being and be willing to be dislodged of the sense of belonging. We must learn to face and embrace our failures, our limitations, the illegible and the vulnerable within us our personal and collective trauma, and to realize that all safety, as James Baldwin says, is an illusion. Black people, poor people, immigrants, some women, and queer folks know that already. This is the road to finding out what freedom really means. Freedom is a very dangerous thing. Anything else is disastrous, but freedom is dangerous. We have got to make choices, very dangerous choices. And not only that, but if you are really giving yourself to this work, consolation and consolation prizes will evade your grasp. The dark night of the soul cannot be voted out of existence. Let me say a very important word about inconsolability. Inconsolability is a concept that Dietrich Bonhoeffer expressed in his well-known poem, Christians and Pagans. Inconsolability is not hopelessness or despair or consolation in the sense of a present or future abolition of suffering. But in the first instance, a holding firmly on to agony against every possibility of escaping into numbness. In other words, better agony than numbness. COVID-19 is just another drop in a very bitter cup. Through wake work, we have an opportunity to watch and see sharply, to wait and feel deeply, to wrestle mostly with ourselves and think painfully, and then rise up and claim our share of the power of life. The basic experience of resistance is receiving the gift of power, which is an exodus from imposed and self-generated impotence, and a break from the violence that that impotence, which is in us, seeks to hide from us. Just one cautionary word about power. The only good power is that power that distributes itself and makes us and others strong for what we really want to live for. I said when we started that there is a deep connection between love and death, not just physical death, but the death and rebirth of the old self. 
There is something about proximity to death and being consigned voluntarily or involuntarily to death puts people in the place to receive the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? That spirit that transforms what is damaged and what damages. That force that has the power to make us free. What freedom, what does freedom look and feel like when it is fastened to a rupture? fastened to things coming undone and breaking apart. I am talking about a despair that is aligned with freedom and is a viable source of revolutionary vitality. Embrace it, it's wake work. It is often when love, rage, envy, pride, grief, shame, hatred, and all, and all are at play that we come to the realization that sometimes upheaval brings us to the realization that nothing can save us. Not all of our money, not our bombs, nor our guns, not technologies, not education, not work or leisure, if we cannot achieve that long, long, long delayed maturity. That process of saying yes to life, of pursuing love and hope and joy, not as feelings, but as disciplines, disciplines to be cultivated in the cauldron of the struggles of everyday life. Those struggles, those sufferings, that grief, if we can alchemize it with love, will birth the art, the music, the cultural expression, the resilience and the beauty that keeps us alive, sets us free, and makes us whole. Step up, step out, be counted, wade in the water, enter into the passion that will enable you to confront death and will lead you to life, true life, real life in the wake. Amen. Thank you, Lenise. Linus, you're telling us that it's only out of our hands if we will not pick it up and that we can think painfully and act outrageously. And I am just so grateful for you to be here right now amidst this speaker series that is asking the question of where do we go from here? There is something to be done and these times are bringing it forward. So thank you so much. Thank you very, very much for voicing all that you carry and all that you can share with us. <laughs> so thank you very, very, very much, everyone, for being here. Um, it is such a blessing for us to be supporting Lenise and spreading her, her beautiful and extremely important message. Um, we um, are not um, asking for any donation. And I want to speak just a little bit about the gift economy that we're using at East Point, which is a different way of like, of dealing with money. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen uh, just in a second. So stay with me here. Um, we're trying to, to offer alternatives to the capitalist model that every, we know. Um, and um, at East Point right now, we're asking you to look within yourself and wonder what, um, what would feel right for you in terms of supporting Lenise and East Point. Um, so we, here, so we use the gift economy model. Um, I'm going to go into slideshow. Here, for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's, a, it's an economy which is based on generosity, access, interdependence, intention, equity, transparency, and faith. And we have faith at East Point that by not asking anyone for anything and for allowing everyone to come and join our events, we have faith that the community will come together and to continue supporting our work and over the years, we've relied heavily on our community support. Uh, last year, we, with our commitment to transparency, we can tell you that our expenses were close to $120,000. And 
it's incredible to think that 96, I mean, around 96,000 dollars were coming from the community and we had over a thousand people who came to our, to our space. And so we really, in this moment, like, ask you what feels right for you, what feels right in terms of like supporting Denise and I and continuing to bring speakers. And um, we have so many people over time who's, who have been asked this question and we're still here. So we, our faith continues. And um, gift economy can be almost summarized in uh, the spirit of gift economy can be almost summarized in one quote from Marshall Rosenberg, which is when giving is done out of pure joy, which Lenise was just speaking about. You can't tell who the giver is and who the recipient is. And so really what would bring you joy today in supporting us? Um, there are different options for you to, to support us. Our web and um, what we're gonna do is just bring all the donations together and share them with Lenise based on needs. And so we really are committed to um, the well-being of all of the speakers who come through this space. And so we hope that um, that they can also be supported by by sharing space with us and with you. Thank you. With that said, uh, we'll come back to um, the topic of of our talk, wake work. Lenise, would you want to share with us uh, what the type of um, reflection that you'd like to invite us in breakout rooms? Okay. So I'd like us to think about the fact that we are the afterlife as we live and breathe day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute of COVID-19. We are living, right? Some of us have not died, June Jordan said. Some of us remain. What will we do, those of us who remain? The question is, what would wake work look like in our lives individually and collectively in our communities? What does wake work look like in your context? Powerful words, powerful words from Reverend Lenise. Thank you again for being here, for sticking with us. We're going to transition into a moment of um, Q&A where you can also feel free to share reflections from the breakout rooms. Yeah, I see one question in the chat, Reverend Lenise, um, from Kenley. I heard you use the term spiritual distancing. Can you speak more about this? <clears throat> yes. Um, I think in, if I were to sort of nutshell it, I would say that we want to um, definitely have some space between us and the domination systems of the world. Okay, that there is a way in which I've said before, I think I said it in Revolutionary Suicide, I'm not sure, maybe it was in the, uh, the interview, but much beyond race and class and um, gender and sexuality and all those things, the question that needs to be, I think even, even over, primary over, those identities, the question needs to be asked, where do we stand in relationship to um, domination and subordination and subjugation, right? And so when I talk about spiritual distancing, we want to be creating more and more and more and more distance between ourselves, our communities, and any form of subjugation, um, domination, that causes suffering for any people anywhere. I chose in this, you know, talk to, to center black people, but I could have, you know, talked about this in an intersectional way, that we, we must uh, move away from um, forms of, of, of deathliness, from the death culture and the death machine. Um, we can't do it on our own. 
but we have to do it in community. We can do it in the midst of other people. We have to be willing to take those steps back. And that means basically, let me just say really quickly, that means to um, not only divest, but there's a word that I've used in other context, context, which is destitute, right? We need to step back from those systems, right? Not just resist them, but step back and let them die as shills, right? Just step aside and let them, let them die. We've got to create alternatives to the, to the death machine to the death culture. We've got to move, we don't, we cannot join the zombie death march is the way that I think I've put it in the past. We've got to move back. So destituting means not to constitute. Well, don't prop up these systems, step back and distance. And that is a spiritual distancing, I believe. You know, of course I'm, you know, a, a Sunday school <laughs> person, but I believe that the spirit is what enables us to do that. And that can be the spirit of life, the spirit of love, the spirit that moves us from, you know, social, from, from fear to hope. You know, it can be the wisdom of the ecosystem. You know, it can be any number of different things, but it's that life-giving spirit, what Christians call the Christic spirit, that supersedes, you know, just history or circumstances or eminence or whatever. Um, that love spirit that never dies um, gives us the power in community, not as individuals, to do it. We can be birthed into it. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. There is another question in the chat from Michelle. Um, can you speak more about revolutionary patience? And so the mm -hmm. Michelle is, is writing, I feel a shiver of recognition of some things I've been chewing on reflected in that term, but I'd like to hear more about what you mean by it. When I say revolutionary patience, I don't mean, um, I wanna be clear, and I don't want people to be confused about this. I don't mean that we should wait, you know, sit around and wait for um, someone else's, you know, movement or progress. You know, I'm saying it's not, it's not that we're passive or that we step back, but it is that I think that we tie in to um, what I've referred in some instances in the past to the Kairos and the Kronos movement. This is a particular moment in history. And we don't have the eyes as individuals. Our seeing comes again in community, right? In loving communities of structures of accountability and support, right? And it is in community that we will understand the time, right? when particular things are to happen, we'll be able to read the signs, we'll know what time it is, for lack of a better way to put it, right? And so when I talk about patience, revolutionary patience, what I think I'm getting at is, you know, revolutionary radical is to get to the root of what it is that is actually happening right, to understand what time it is so that we know how to move appropriately in time, right? And, it's, and, we, and we, can't, we can't be impatient if we don't know what time it is. We have to be patient enough to determine what time it is because a lot of our action, particularly in progressive communities, is, you know, aborted. Right, they're, they're births, they're still births. They're, they're, they're births that don't ever come to fruition. There's work that never comes to fruition because we're jumping out there and we don't really, we don't know what time it is. We're not in sync with um, the spirit. And so we've got to close the gap between our material reality and our spiritual reality and, um, and allow that be spiritually challenged to know that just because it's painful doesn't mean it's time to move, right? There's work that needs to be done. And we don't want to turn people loose um, 
on folks when we're not ready. We've got to, we've got to be changed. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of maturity. We've got to be changed. We've got to be willing to do what Dorothy Day said of Martin King in her eulogy, to die daily, right? And what does that mean? It means to die to our own selves. In what sense, right? Not, not the annihilation of ourselves in some in a crazy uh, world domination sense, but the annihilation of ourselves, those, that self that doesn't lead to life, those parts of our cultures of ourselves that are not generative of life, right? And so we need time to do that. Have you all ever seen in, particularly in progressives, and I can say that because I consider myself to be a person that's on the sort of progressive or radical end, uh, people that just jumping out willy nilly to do work, you know, wealthy folks being turned loose on, on poor folks, you know, men being turned loose on women, straight folks being turned loose on queer folk, white folk being turned loose on people of color. Right, and we end up doing damage because we don't have the patience to listen, to wait, to wrestle, to struggle, to have our hips dislodged like Jacob. You know what I'm saying? We don't have, we don't, we don't have the, we don't have the, 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 the willingness to get out of the way because when the spirit wants to move, the spirit is going to move, right? And what we, all we need to do is be ready as vessels. How do we make ourselves ready? as vessels and be ever asking, what does the spirit want to do in and through me, in and through my people, in and through my communities, in and through the people that I consider to be enemies? What is the spirit trying to do in this time? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. A lot of, reactions in the chat uh, reverend denise if you want to look or if you are seeing it i see uh cecilia also uh, who raised their hand her hand actually cecilia would you want to unmute yourself uh sure thank you so much for this um this might actually be a similar question now that i think about it um but the the framework of wake what was really um, uh, percolating in me too is this um, this simultaneity or tension of space for mourning and the space beyond words and and the wailing um, and the being and the being knocked down and not knowing and <laughs> Um, and simultaneously all of the pragmatic immediate work and caretaking, the bringing of the food, the offering of the song, the, um, you know, the cleaning, <laughs> the grocery shop, you know, all of that. And so I guess, you know, extended metaphorically also into our um, world transforming work too. I'm wondering um, how, how do you grapple with that tension, that tension of the urgency of the, um, the things that, that need doing and the surrender to the need of, of all that other weight, that patience piece? You know what, I actually think you hit the nail on the head when you said many years ago, uh, the term of collectivizing our, um, uh, what do we say, resources and collectivizing our security and our risk, right? And so basically, I think it's a process of collectivization that we cannot do this thing alone. It's got, we've got different, different parts. In the same way that I was talking about the wake, people had different, different, uh, you know, there was Kitchen Coleman and Kitchen Coleman brought the food, you know what I'm saying? And, and her sisters, the sisters that worked with Kitchen Coleman, right? And then it was Brother Mac that did, you know, the, the looked after the, the facility and his folks. And then it was some, and so there's a sort of collectivizing, which is also a part of wake work. Like, how do we get together 
and do competence-based leadership. Let me focus on the stuff that's really that I can do, right? And let somebody else focus on the stuff that they can do. But we bring what we have into the collective. And I think that that, that is the way that if we are um, working as individual uh, units, it's, it's impossible. Because the other thing is that we can't prioritize just working individually. We can't really see what needs to be done. See, that's part of, that's part of what wake, wake work is too, knowing what needs to be done when, right? And, and we learn that in community. There were so many times that when I was pastoring, I mean, y'all taught me how to, how to be a pastor. Y'all made me a pastor. And I had to learn what the priorities were uh, from being in community. Because grandma you said, you know, you can't, you don't know what your, what, what your, you know, what your back look like in terms of you don't know what you look like from behind. You know, you don't know when your skip is, when your slip is hanging and your booty's showing or whatever. You don't know that. You need somebody to tell you that. So it's in that collective bumping up against each other that we come to know better ourselves, but not only that, it's by having our own presuppositions and assumptions tested. It's by being called out, right? That we get to, to know. And not just be by being called out, but being affirmed, right? And asking the questions and talking about what, and the other thing that I should say is, baby, it's about vulnerability. Lord, it's about vulnerability. We just have to, we have to, one of the things, let me just tell you, Somebody asked me a couple years ago, why are you so happy and full of joy now? And I said, I, I got rid of my secrets. And they said, you're talking about sexuality? I said, no, baby, that's the least of it. And I said, I came out, you know, as queer, you know, 45 years ago or something. I said, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that I'm my limitations. I have limitations and fragil fragilities. And I'm nuts. You know what I'm saying? I have mood things and unhappinesses and grief and feeling, feelings, you know what I'm saying? Just struggling. And so being able to just be like, I'm, I'm, I've got limitations and I'm going to live within the, 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 you know, spirit of those limitations because it's not just about me. I got people, honey. I got y'all. And so that's what I think this is about. Part of what COVID's about, which is, I, which is the irony of social distancing. Because what it's making people who, you know, get, get, get it, understand is that, baby, we are connected and interconnected, right? There's no way around it. And I don't care how long we have to wear masks and how long we have to be six feet apart. We're not going to be able to live without each other, baby. That's the end. And I mean across divisions and divides and every conceivable wall and barrier, you know, we need to be like, ain't no mountain high enough. And whatever we have to do, baby, we have to figure out how to lay hands on each other in the midst of COVID-19 and say, be healed. I mean, be healed and made every whit whole. We have to be able to, to pray each other up out and love each other up, in, you know, listen each other into voice and pray each other up out of depression. And I mean with power, right? To believe that healing is possible when you can't physically touch somebody. I don't need to physically touch you. I can love you right now. That's one thing that the spirit has given us, the ability to without stimulus, without a, 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 a being stimulated, right? I have the power in me by virtue of the spirit of love and life to love you. And we on Zoom and you can feel my love. You can feel the connection. We can't lose that. Cause see the people want us to lose that. Some of the people want us to lose that. Some of the powers that be want us to lose that, right? But we can't do it. We can't do it. And so cry out baby. And let's get in community and figure out how to help each other do what we need to do. I'm crazy as a loon. And the only reason why I'm even here today to do anything is because I love some people and they love me. And that really is all that has saved my life.
Wow. <laughs> Crazy is required. I feel like we should have minutes of silence like every time after you speak <laughs> to just take in. <laughs> but the chat, the chat suggests not silence, but hollering and just, <laughs> there's so much love coming back at you right yeah. now, Lanise. I, I don't know if you're seeing the chat, but. I love you all so much. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you, you have oh. the mm, mm -mm. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, it's so sad to think we have five minutes left. There is so much love pouring into the chat. The faces are bright on the screen, or serious because what is being talked about is just both. I mean, you bring both, Reverend Lenise. You bring the joy, and you bring the grief, and you bring all the complexity of mm. what it means to be living mm. in these times. So just for just for doing that like that's an incredibly powerful powerful message and embodiment thank you for for that we have four minutes left um i'm wondering would you have closing comments for us and we'll have time to unmute in the last minute for people to just voice their gratitude into the space um yeah what are your last words i know that people are muted and I don't know, I don't know that it's possible to unmute people, but I want to uh, lead us in a song. Can we do, is it possible to do that? And y'all yeah. know the song, a lot of y'all know the song, some of y'all don't, but if you don't, you can catch on to it. But let's just sing this song in the last couple of minutes together. <clears throat> we should sing so back at, at first. You ready? People All might right. probably, oh, go ahead. I just want to say it's probably better that everyone stays muted because otherwise the song will not come. Oh, you sing it. Okay, you sing it in your own. Yeah, you're still everyone, connected. Just do it. Like, I'll lead you in the song and you sing it in your own in your own spaces. It goes, my heart is fixed. My mind is made up. My heart is fixed. I'm going to do what love say do. I'm going to do what the love say do. I'm going to do what the love say do. I'm going to do what love say do. I'm going to do what love say do. Well, my heart is fixed. My mind is made up. My heart is fixed. I'm going to do what the love say do. Well, I'm going to do what the love say do. I'm going to do what the love say do. I'm going to do what the love say do. I'm going to do what the love say do. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My mind is, my heart is fixed. My yes. mind is fixed. You're going to do what? What the love say do, honey. I'm telling you. Yes. Amen. Oh, yeah. Come on, girl. Oh. Mm -hmm. My mind, my mind. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Yes. 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 Oh, oh, oh. Help careful. me to love. You're gonna have some church around here. Yes. 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 I love y'all. I love you too, Rev.